Okay, well, let's gather for Through the Looking Glass as we learn the story of God's love through the, the stained glass windows. Let us pray first. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the love that you've shown us throughout the centuries to all of your people and creation. We give you thanks for artists who have told your story, not always in words, but in images that capture our hearts and our minds and our eyes. Bless our time together so that we might discover and rediscover what it means to love you, love our neighbor, and love creation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share the screen here. Everybody see that first slide okay? Yes. All right. Yes. I'm going to get you all stretched out on my other screen so I can see your shining faces. From the church? Yes. This is um, uh, the, the Trinity window up front. Um, so um, I kind of use it uh, as the, the main one that I come back to all the time. Um, so let me, let me talk first uh, about some introductory things here in session one. Uh, some things to know about the glass windows and the artist. Um, first, the, the artist was named August Mulder. Uh, he taught at Augsburg's uh, College in Minneapolis for many years. He uh, emigrated here from Estonia via Australia um, and came to uh, Minnesota in about 1958. Um, our windows must have been a very early work of his because our sanctuary was built in the early 1960s. Um, and so uh, he went on to produce windows at uh, Ascension Chapel at Augustana College, uh, Luther Seminary, uh, lots of churches throughout the Midwest. Um, and he was an artist in residence at Augsburg for 20 years. Uh, he died in 1982 at a rather young age of 68. Uh, he was born, as I said, in Estonia, and uh, he created stained glass mosaics which, like the most stone mosaics of, um, of ages past, uh, are made up of scraps or, or small pieces of broken uh, glass uh, or rock. And he was a pioneer of the mosaic art technique of faceted stained glass. If you ever noticed up close, our, uh, the glass that's used is not flat glass. Uh, it's not like you'll find in some churches where the window is um, almost appears to be painted upon or uh, everything is kind of, kind of um, flat. Um, you'll notice that the pieces that are used in the window are of differing size and shapes. They all have a kind of broken effect to them. And that gives it a lot of depth and it gives it a, a way that the light plays off it in various ways. Um, if you've never noticed that next time you're in the building when that's possible, hopefully soon, um, you can take a look at that. Uh, he restored glass windows for a long time before he started making them himself. Um, and I guess I told you the rest of that already. Tip my hand. So Holy Trinity's windows, whether you've noticed or not, present the biblical story of God's love. Uh, Thirteen windows are along the north side of the sanctuary, and those are all Old Testament windows. Um, they follow the story of God from creation all the way to the end of the Old Testament. Then on the other side, there are 13 windows, which are the story of the New Testament. Um, the window behind the altar represents the Trinity, the namesake of the congregation. Uh, and we'll get to talking about that later. We're going to begin with the, the 26 on each side. The windows in the back of the sanctuary, which um, some of you who've been around way longer than I have, uh, may be able to make sure I'm correct in this. Um, th they were put in at a little later time, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the same artist was responsible for them. Uh, but they, they de depict uh, Christian life and the high festivals of the church year. And so we'll talk about those as well. Um, 
Any other things that you guys know about the stained glass windows that uh, I haven't covered or I don't know because I wasn't here? No, I installed it in the frame. So the, the uh, ones at the back of the sanctuary were added later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were <clears throat> they weren't um, put in at the same time as the sanctuary being built. Right. And I yeah. think I think at least one of the stained glass windows um, was uh, given by Loanne Dodge and in, in memory of her husband. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think the ones along the back of the sanctuary all have a memorial plaque associated with them. So okay. I, oh, know. I didn't even know they have plaques on them. Do they? I'm yeah, there's sorry. a little plaque on the inside on the sanctuary side. Oh, I haven't even noticed that. I'll have to look at that sometime. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was often a way uh, throughout the history of the church that stained glass windows were added to buildings. They've never been a cheap affair. Um, it takes the artist, you know, time to do that. Um, and uh, it's a very labor intensive process. So um, they're often gifts from a member or a group of members or whatever. Um, and that's been true since they started building churches, I suppose. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, the, the first windows I want to talk about, the first eight windows are uh, kind of all gathered in under the, the heading of creation and promise. Um, and they, uh, the first eight deal with um, creation uh, through the entry into the promised land. So they're kind of the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible um, that are dealt with there. The stained glass windows at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church follow the story of Scripture. You hear that okay? So the first window begins with creation in the book of Genesis. At the top of the window, the artist has placed the hand of God. The hand of God often refers to divine providence and power to create, to intervene in the acts of history. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. On the third day of creation, we're told in scripture that God created the plant life. And so the artist has placed a tall evergreen tree surrounded by flowers in this particular window. I had never noticed that. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. On the fifth day of creation, creatures start to inhabit the earth, and so the artist has placed birds of the air and fish of the sea in the midst of this window. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. The creation story teaches us to love God. God is the creator and source of life and being. Everything that exists in our very existence itself comes from the hand of God. The roof over our head, the shoes on our feet, the breath in our lungs and the heartbeat that goes on and on in our chests all signs of God's love and nurture of 
us and creation, everything that puts food on our table and all the things that we receive as blessings in life are from the creator. And so love is a response to one who cares for us and loves us and creates us. We love God because God is the source of life and the reason we exist. We also learn from the creation story to love our neighbor. Even though it's not shown in the window, God creates every human being. And if you look into the eyes of any other human being, you find there a creature of God. If you are beloved, then I am beloved. If I am beloved, then everyone I meet is beloved. So loving neighbor is an acknowledgement of God's creative force in making them, but it's also an acknowledgement that God has created the abundance of the world for everyone to enjoy in justice and harmony. We also learn to love creation in the creation story. Anything that God creates is to be loved if we love God. And so the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, the trees and the flowers and all the plants that grow, the rocks and the mountains, lakes and rivers, everything that God has made is a creature of God. If we love God, we will love creation. We cannot create, but we can till and keep what God has made. We can be stewards of all of the abundance that God has given us. So that's the first window. And if you're wondering where it is, it's the one that's closest to Gene every Sunday. Well, I'll check it out. Yep. You get to sit by creation every single week. All right. Well, what'd you hear there or see there uh, that you'd like to discuss or share? I learned a lot. I did not. I looked at it every Sunday for years, but I guess I did not realize what it all symbolized. But now that you showed me, I can surely see all of those things. So I've learned something new. Yay, my job is done. Thanks for coming. <laughs> What about the notion of the creation story as a way of learning to love God, love neighbor, and love creation? Did you hear anything there that was insightful? I won't claim that. I mean, I learned it from somebody else. <laughs> but, uh, I think just to remember that that's a that isn't a story from the for the past. That's a story for us mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And 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 how you know the whole thing of of loving creation is what we need to be embracing for caring about our environment. Yeah. It's often easy just to put the creation story as some kind of myth that we learned in a book and it was a long, long time ago and it doesn't have anything to do with us today. But the very processes that are part of creation, you know, um, the, the procreation of species, the uh, the way crops continue to grow, um, evolution uh, as, as we've come to understand it, um, uh, nuclear fission and fusion and, and the cosmos, all of those are, are testaments to the process begun in creation where God is not only creating but sustaining everything that gives us grace and abundance. It's still going on. All right, well, let's go to the second window. The second window in our series was called by the artist Sin and Expulsion. It deals with those aspects of what's commonly called the fall in the book of Genesis. 
You'll notice at the top of the window, there is a serpent coiled around a tree. Uh, two pieces of this story that are very important. The tree that is forbidden and the serpent that tempts. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. There's plenty of blame to go around in this story about the loss of innocence in the garden. At the bottom of the window, you'll see images of a sword and tongues of flame, and it refers to the expulsion from the garden and the change from a life in paradise to a life in this world. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So what do we learn about loving God in this story? It seems like a God of punishment. And yet, if they'd obeyed, they'd have still been in paradise. When commands are given by God in love, obedience is a way of loving God back, of trusting that our divine parent, as we pray our Father, is one who tells us things to do and not to do because of love, not power. What does it mean to learn to love your neighbor from this story? Well, blame and deflection is certainly not how we love one another. Obviously, the first schism between man and woman is in this story as they blame and seek to defer to first one another and then the snake. How do we learn to love creation from this story? Well, first, the serpent is a creature, not the one who created it. And so we should not listen to creation, to creature. It is to be honored, but it is not to be worshiped. It is not the source of our life and our love. That comes from God alone. So it places us in a proper relationship with creation, not to worship it or to listen to it, but to listen to God alone. So let's talk about sin and expulsion. 
what did you see in the window or hear in the, the story as it unfolded that uh, gave you pause or brought questions or uh, what images uh, struck you? I think one of the things to point out about the book of Genesis, especially in its earliest chapters, is that these are stories that explain why things are the way they are. So when your son's out in the field with you and you're working and he, and he looks up and he says, oh, there's a snake. How come we're all scared of snakes? And there are stories that tell you why snakes aren't the favorite thing in the world. Uh, other stories are about why is it so hard for us to, uh, to make a living? Um, others are, um, you know, what happened to um, the paradise that God had created in the beginning? If it was all good, how come, how come it's not all good now? Um, so a lot of the stories that we have in Genesis are ways of uh, providing meaning for the facts of life. They shouldn't always be read as some kind of um, uh, linear or categorical historical process. Um, we're not talking about events that you know, were chronicled in a newspaper back in the, uh, um, the Garden of Eden press um, five, six, eight, 10,000 years ago, however long it might've been. Um, we're talking about holy stories that got passed on so that we could learn the meaning of why the world is the way it is. So this is probably way out of line or way off base, but... Um, you never are. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like, you know, we have creation. We've got people, we've got plants, and we've got animals, and and all of them have, in some way, rebelled against God. Is is that does that lead then to the fact that you know animals hunt other animals, or that people hunt animals, or you know some plants are poisonous, and you know it's it's just led to disharmony in, on the earth? That's a really good question, actually. It's not way off base at all. Um, one of the things to notice from this story, and it took, took uh, me a long time to kind of get my arms around this, um, but notice that, the, that the, the tree that they're supposed to stay away from is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, at the center of this story is an attempt to explain how it is that humans are different than animals. How it is that I'm somehow different than my dog or the squirrel in the backyard or dairy cows or whatever the thing is. And why are we so complicated? Okay. And so one of the things that it introduces is that we understand good, the, the difference between good and evil. And think about that for a minute. That introduces into the human experience the ability to ask the question that you just asked. It introduces the ability to say, wait a minute, that's not right. Or how come, how come this plant is this way and this plant isn't this way? And how come the world works this way and it doesn't work this way? How come things are justice and they're not justice? Um, it gives us this ability to know good and evil and that's a huge burden for us. It's a huge burden for us to bear. It's actually a burden that, according to the story, God wanted to keep us from. But humans being humans, we come to, to understand it. And so um, uh, things were probably always exactly as they were in the Garden of Eden, maybe the story is saying, um, they were that way in the Garden of Eden. There were, there were snakes, obviously, in the Garden of Eden. There were obviously things they weren't supposed to touch and things they shouldn't eat. Uh, and at some point, they asked the question, why not? And now, 
humans, curious as they are, become their own worst enemy. So I think there's a wisdom to the spiritual condition of humanity here that says there is something about us humans that just can't accept that everything is the way it is and, you know, we try things, we push boundaries. Um, you know, uh, my dog is smart enough not to eat a ghost pepper. He will lick that thing and back away from it immediately. He probably won't even lick it because he'll smell it and know what's going on. I'm not that bright. <laughs> I will test the limits of that. Now, that's a really, that's a really kind of dumb example of the things that we as humans do all the time. So I think there's a layer of spiritual and um, maybe anthropological insight into this story that, that explains then why it is that, that we can't just live like God, because we're not. And when we try to live like God, well, then we find out we're not. And that seems to me what this story is really about. Adam and Eve find out that they are not like God. It's not what the serpent said. You will not be like God. As a matter of fact, when your eyes are open, you'll discover just how far from God you are. And that will change your life and your perspective. Does that help at all, Mark? Yeah, thank you. It kind of also explains to me or for me that uh, the whole question about why do bad things happen to good people it's everything got messed up in the garden. I mean, you wouldn't have known any different. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Until, uh, I, I, I don't think creatures of the world make those evaluations. Right. <laughs> you know, um, if you watch some of the wonderful programming that's on, on National Geographic or BBC or whatever about the earth, and, and it, certainly it is cruel and you watch the animals and that sort of thing, but you don't see, um, you don't see a herd of antelope um, having an ethical conversation about leopards. Um, they, they, just, they just know that's the way it is and they don't ask any questions. Um, now the question at the root of this is, is there a kind of underhanded or other-sided blessing that comes from the curiosity of humanity? And the answer of course, as the story goes on is yeah but there's a cost. Is that why Lucifer was banned also and turned into Satan because he wanted to be God too? You know, the, the thread through all of the beginning chapters of Genesis and in the uh, extra biblical uh, things like the story of Lucifer and that sort of thing, um, they all have that same theme. Every story from Genesis 1 through 11 is somehow about the way in which humanity wants to be like God. Think of the Tower of Babel. What's the main problem there? Is it technology that they can now make bricks? No, that's not a problem. They want to use the bricks to build a, a, a tower so they can go up to heaven and be God. And God says, well, we can't have that. It, it's almost like God says, we've been over this before. You can't be up here because you're not God. Um, the flood story, everything else that we come across is exactly what you just said, Linda, that we want to be like God. Um, and whenever that happens, whenever we say uh, we are God, or, you know, today people don't say that too much. They just say they've been sent by God, which I think if you could examine somehow in their brain, they still do believe they're God. Um, that, uh, you know, we get ourselves in trouble because we start to act and do things that um, are incompatible with the way the world is made. Say, so, Tim, I, yeah. I also thought, too, is, a, is the beginning of the spiritual war between Satan and God. Uh, you know, he, he had his challenges, you know, uh, whether as a Job or, uh, or Christ being baptized and, and, and uh, Christ had to fight his way. Uh, for 40 days and 40 nights and uh, but it's always a challenge to the old testament too is it was his bat as i and he used uh, satan like to use god's this people you know for these challenges you know this is a strange story yeah in job, 
in Job, it says that, you know, God and, and the devil are having a discussion. And God says, okay, you know, have at Job. Um, I think it's important to read Job as a parable and not as a historical account. Um, mm -hmm. There may have been a guy named Job, but, you know, any story that starts, so God and the devil are sitting in a bar. <laughs> I got should, you. Give, should give you a signal that we're not doing history here. But it's recognizing the fact that Satan or the tempter, the serpent in the garden, anybody who speaks to us and tempts us to think that we're God or to think that we have all the answers or to think contrary to God is the devil. Um, we're going to hear in this Sunday's lesson. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because Peter is tempting him with another way than the way of the cross. Stay tuned, more in the sermon. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think uh, you see this battle, but um, we also shouldn't do, how many of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson? Okay, and his character, Geraldine, who always said, <laughs> the devil made me do it. <laughs> That's a cop out. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. All the devil can do is tempt us and speak lies, lies that we believe. And I tell you what, um, the commercials on TV are about as effective as anything of, of speaking the word of the devil. You know, hey, hon, I really think we've got to get rid of that two year old, whatever it is, to get that because that'd be a lot of, it'd even save energy. You ever had that conversation? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Satan speaking loud and clear. The two-year-old one is just fine. It's just fine, leave it alone. Any other thoughts? That's, a good, yeah. that's a good point. I could get caught up behind the, the story instead of what it really is. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely the key. Uh, Philip, you, you've, whenever you're reading a biblical story, after you're done with the story, you got to, you got to ask the question, where am I in this story? <laughs> How is this speaking to me? Because it's a living word and it's supposed to encounter everybody who reads it. Um, so the question is always, where am I in this? Who's the snake that's talking to me now? Who am I believing that I shouldn't believe? You know, There was a sword, a picture of a sword in there too. Is that what they used to cut the apple down with? No, actually that was um, the flaming sword that was placed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden to make it sure that the humans couldn't go back to paradise. Um, actually, I, I heard it taught, uh, my, 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 one of my uh, Hebrew teachers uh, who I took Genesis from, Ralph Derman, God rest his soul. He just died a few months ago, or a month or two ago. Um, Ralph was a brilliant scholar. And um, he taught us that, you know, he believes strongly as a Lutheran scholar that every single story in scripture bore grace. There was a sign of grace in the midst of it, if you looked hard enough. And uh, in this particular one, I remember him telling us, so God sets up a situation where the, the people have messed up and now they're going to be expelled from the garden. They can't come back again. And the reason they can't come back again is because they can't handle what's in the garden. It will destroy them. And so God has to lock the door and close it off and say, no, nope, sorry, um, this is bad for you. Now that you know the difference between good and evil, paradise isn't paradise anymore. And so God closes the entrance Yeah, I don't know what kind of fruit it was, uh, Linda. It's been suggested when they found out that avocados were full of cholesterol, that it could have been avocados uh, that they ate. Um, I, I tend to think it's pomegranates because getting the seeds out is just, <laughs> man. Um, or there's a fruit that grows in Southeast Asia, which smells like rotting flesh. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but that could have been it too. Um, I'm guessing that the, the snake picked 
pick the fruit that was easiest to pick. All right, let's move on. The second window in our series was called by the artist Sin. And Sorry. There we go. The next window combines two stories from Genesis to give us the origins of facts of human life. The first fact of life is that we live and we die. The second fact is that our life is filled with hard work. And the third fact, well, that's that human beings can get to the point where they'll even murder one another. The first image to note here is the shovel at the top of the window. It signifies Adam's toil. Now that he's been cast out of Eden, he's going to have to work very hard to get his living eked out from a ground that produces thorns and thistles. And to the man, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Anyone who's been to an Ash Wednesday service will recognize the repeat of the words, you are dust and to dust you shall return, which remind us of the reality of human finitude. The fact is that we live and that we all die. We also notice here that hard work is at the center of our lives. In the center of the window, the artist has placed a plow. According to notes from the artist, this signifies the work of Cain, one of the offspring of Adam and Eve. He's a farmer. The artist doesn't mention that there's a staff to signify the shepherding Abel, but it may be that this little bit of brown here in the shape of a stick could be a staff. Nevertheless, there are two symbols for Cain and Abel at the bottom of the window. The first is Abel's offering, rising up to God as accepted. And the second is Cain's offering, not rising up to heaven, being rejected by God. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. It would be wrong to assume that God is distinguishing between the types of offerings. After all, Adam himself has been given the shovel at the top of the window in order to bring forth his life from the ground, the fruit of the ground. And so Cain has followed in his footsteps. There seems to be a difference here in the kind of offering. What we might notice is that Cain brought the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and that's all it says. While Abel, for his part, a term that sets it apart and makes it different, brought the firstlings and their fat portions, which for a shepherding community is the very best that can be offered. It may be the quality of the offering that is in mind in the differences in this story. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Jealousy, revenge, retribution. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. So what do we learn about loving God from these stories? Perhaps the th first thing is that work is a vocation and a calling. God provides it for us. Even if the work is hard, God has allowed us to bring forth a living from the world. It may not be the paradise that drops fruit on our heads, but it is nevertheless a vocation and calling. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 2, we find that we have been placed here to till and keep the garden. Second, we learn that the way we love God is by offering our best, not just in offerings even, but in the way we live our life. Second best, or just an offering for the sake of making the offering, maybe isn't quite what it means to love God. How do we learn to love neighbor in this passage? Well, we learn how not to. Jealousy, revenge, retribution, all stop love. It makes it impossible to love the neighbor when we are consumed with ourselves. We are taught that we are in fact our brothers or our neighbor's keeper. God holds us accountable for the way that we treat others. And then even more, God hears the cries of the oppressed and the innocent victim. We can't walk off and ignore them. God hears their voices. What do we learn about loving creation from these stories? Perhaps that our toil should not be seen as punishment so much as partnership with God in the care of creation. As I mentioned, Genesis 2 tells us that we are stewards sent here to till and to keep creation. I think maybe I'll leave the image up so you can continue to look at that. Um, that might be a better thing to do. So uh, what about the window that's entitled Adam's Toil, Cain and Abel? What do you see in the window? what did you hear in the story? I know I definitely would not have picked any of those items out and particularly uh, the, the bottom third reaching out. The versus, offerings, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I never would have picked that out. I have some cliff notes from the artist. Not much, but a little bit. So there were more than one where I went, there's what, where? Oh. <laughs> Are there thistles? Are those things that have points on the end or those that are white? Are those thistles? No, that's smoke rising. So when an oh. offering is made, the offering is burnt. And so on the left uh, is Abel or uh, yeah, Abel's offering, which rises up to heaven. And the uh, other one, the artist has chosen to show that God rejected Cain's offering because it doesn't rise up. The smoke uh, is more like my, uh, my grill in the summer in my face. Does that have to do with attitude more than anything? What you know, you it, could be, it could be attitude. Um, like I say in the narrative, the only textual clue that we get is that um, the, 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 the verse tells us that um, 
goes to great lengths to tell us that um, Abel, for his part, which means different than Cain, gave the, the firstlings, the firstborn of the clock, and gave the fat portions, the best. And all it tells us of Cain is that he just gave from the fruit of the ground. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe he, you know, gave the gleanings at the end of the harvest. Maybe it was the, the sour grapes. I don't know. Um, but it seems to be in the quality of it. And that certainly reflects an attitude, uh, an attitude toward God of uh, love and, and gratitude or uh, kind of that duty bound thing. Well, I have to give God something, you know, see what you can scrape out from the bottom of the bin. Um, so I do think it has uh, ultimately to do with faith as all of these stories do. Well, I'm thinking again of what you said about, you know, how do, how does, how do we fit into this story? And, and I think of the, you know, am I my neighbor's keeper, my brother's keeper, and yeah. God sees the suffering of the poor. And I think about, you know, right now how Congress is considering or maybe not considering, you know, to uh, a, a big package to be able to help the people in the <laughs> pandemic and, and whether or not they choose this big package, I mean, there's still some people who don't think anybody needs any help. And they don't, they don't you know, they want to kill the, the, well, what used to be called the food stamp program. And, yeah. and you know, we, we don't, you know, we don't, we didn't get any help. So therefore, everybody else can lift themselves up by their bootstraps. It's, you know, and, and there it is right there, you know, that God sees the sufferings of, of his people. And, and we are at, we are, called we are commanded really to be our our neighbor's keeper yeah i think for me this story always gives me pause am i my brother's keeper and god implicitly says well of course you are you knucklehead and then do you not hear his bl blood cries out from the ground and and then the the, the very poetic um, turn of the story that says because you've spilled your brother's blood the, the land now is poison to you. You have made it so that you won't be able to get a crop out of the ground because you're a fractured, broken, wandering human being now. Um, look what you have done to yourself as well. There are consequences of the action. God may forgive, and if you read the rest of the story, um, Cain says, well, you know, people are just going to be out there murdering me. And of course, it always brings the question from a confirmation student. Well, who's he afraid of? There's only four of them. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an origin story. It's not history. Um, so he says he'll be a marked man. So God marks him and says, uh, you will be safe because you bear the mark of Cain. Um, and that's a mark of safety uh, that God will, um, will deal with anybody who harms him. Yeah, when it, whenever I hear somebody go as far as to say, you know, um, well, the, the, the poor aren't the government's job. In a democracy, the, since the government is us, I, 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 got, I got some questions about that argument. Um, it seems to me that uh, God certainly says the victims of violence and the victims of, of a lack of compassion certainly cry out from the God. And God hears that. That should give us all pause. Should we try to fit one more window in? Is that okay? Yes. All right. Sure. And it's a favorite story at that. The next window is titled The Deluge. It comes from the sixth chapter of Genesis and accounts for the famous flood story of Noah and his ark. As a preface, Genesis 6, 5 through 7 tells us the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth 
and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created. One of the things that may be going on here is not a story of punishment, but rather an answer to the question, why doesn't God just destroy everything? When you change the question, you get a different answer. In the window, you'll see at the top, clouds formed in blue and white, and you'll see the rain falling upon the ark. Now, all of the components of the story as it continues forward are in this one window, so we need to take them in pieces. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Human beings and animals and creeping things and birds of the air, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark and the water swelled on the earth for 150 days. The ark is shown here in the center receiving the rain and we see the water in which the ark traverses. But we also see at the bottom, the hint of dry land the green of the fields and the brown and rock of mountains. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were, was restrained and the waters gradually receded from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water had abated. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every, every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Notice the rainbow, one of the most famous signs of this whole story. Remember that a bow plays double meanings here. Uh, a bow is the shape of a warfare instrument. And ancient kings took the bow of battle off the wall to signify that war had begun. By hanging the rainbow back up in the heavens, God is declaring that the war between God and humanity is over and that peace will reign. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So how do we learn to love God from this story of Noah and the ark? Well, again, the central message is not about God's judgment. It's about God's faithfulness and God's promise to never destroy. God's covenant with, is with all creatures and all of creation. It's not with just the select people in the ark, but God declares that all of everything God has made will be at peace with God, no matter their evil, no matter the suffering. How do we learn to love neighbor in this story? It might be a little hard to see that in the destruction of everything. And yet, Noah and his family take care of one another and of all the animals. God's covenant, again, is for all, not just some. When we turn that toward our neighbors, we know that they are as blessed by God as we are. They are as forgiven by God as we are, and that they live under the same promises that God gives everyone. So how do we learn to love creation from this story? Well, God's saving act accounts for every animal in all of creation and the restoration of the dry land, the earth itself is preserved and renewed and shares in the covenant that God has made not to destroy. And so that should invite us not to destroy creation either. 
The rainbow covenant is for every creature and all of creation. Everything is valued and beloved in the eyes of God, and so it should be with us. It is a gift, not something that we're supposed to use up, but something that we protect and keep. Okay, so that's the deluge, the flood. What did you see in the imagery? Um, how did that bring things alive for you? And what did you hear in the story that made you pause or think? One of the things I find helpful in all of these stories in the first 11 chapters of Genesis is to kind of in my imagination think about um, my dad and me sitting someplace gnawing on a hot dog or whatever it is. And as a kid, you, you know, you ask those questions, dad, why this, why that, why this, why that? And in a faith community, there are stories that get passed down so that you can explain those hard questions to your kid, right? So, um, Dad, where did the earth come from? Well, in the beginning, there was nothing, and God came over the waters, and first day, second day, seventh, all of that sort of stuff, that's the story. This is, this is where God um, found uh, the capacity to create. Um, in the flood story, when I use that method to think about what is it that the ancient Hebrews are trying to explain and remember, they do this in light of the Exodus, because the oldest story in the Old Testament is not creation, it's Exodus. Everything in the first 11 chapters is looking backwards. So what are they trying to explain? Well, when you look around at all of the other gods that the Hebrews could worship, there's something about all of them in those ancient times that gave us the idea of a god that is full of judgment and wrath. If you do the wrong thing, Zeus will just put a lightning bolt in your eye. If you do the wrong thing, then, you know, whatever the God is, is going to eat you like a big seed monster. And it's all about consequences. It's all about law. Think about what this story does to that idea of God. God changes God's mind and says, I should have never done that. And then promises that God will never, ever punish all of creation. And that we should stop wasting our time waiting for God to destroy the earth because God's mad. This covenant says that will never happen. Ever. This God will never do it. It's almost like the dad looked at the son and said, what'd you say? And he said, well, how come God just, just doesn't destroy all these bad people in the world? And as they ate their hot dog, the dad said, well, God tried that once. And God didn't like the results. And God repented of it. And God would never do that. That's what this story really tells us. The covenant at the end, the rainbow signified covenant, is a covenant with all creatures and all of creation that God will not destroy us, even though there's evil in the world. Now, if you're feeling particularly self-righteous, like I am some days, that may just tick you off. Because I'd like a little bit of targeted destruction once in a while. But God isn't going to do it. That's not the God we worship. When he says, as long as the earth endures. What's that? <clears throat> When he starts his covenant, he says, as long as the earth endures. Yes. Is that a, I mean, what's the meaning of that? Well, I think it means two different things, depending upon what side of the enlightenment you live on. Uh, for ancient people, the earth is permanent. You know, for thousands and thousands of years, as long as their generations have reported, the sun rises and it sets, the sun rises and it sets, the seasons turn. There's no end to it. And as a matter of fact, even up to the time of Sir Isaac Newton, there isn't any sense that, cosmically speaking, 
that the world might not be here. But then because we have different scientific looks at things today and we know that even planets go away, then we live on the other side of a piece of information that says, well, the earth can end. So now what do we do with that? I'm not sure Genesis is thinking that way. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, I answer that question through resurrection, not through the flood story. That if the earth ends, then God still is in, in control and God still has the final word. Does that make any sense, Mark? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so and when it says, until the earth ends, um, you know, for the ancient person that was like, yeah, well, that's never going to happen. I mean, it's tough when you don't have any scientific background to look at, you know, the Rocky Mountains and figure that someday they'll go away. I mean, it's just ludicrous. Wasn't it kind of cool to see all the elements of the story in the window? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's it's the entire set of chapters all in one window, and he squeezes it in that that window that's you know about about twelve feet from Jean's left. Mm -hmm. We didn't mention though that the sun came out and dried up the land, and that's at the very top. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. The artist doesn't say that, so I didn't <laughs> want to make that leap. But oh, that's not a leap. That's pretty clear. <laughs> all right well um thank you for your patience you went a little longer tonight than or i went a little longer than uh we'd uh than i'd planned um so give me just a, a couple of seconds of feedback is this worthwhile or are you sitting there stark bored out of your minds no i love it so you know, I've seen those windows for years, but I, I didn't really understand all of the symbol, symbolism. So I'm, I'm very happy to learn this and I'm anxious to go inside the tree and, and look at them now that I know some more information. Well, and they, they take on a whole devotional life then, which is what stained glass was supposed to do. Um, you know, it was the it was the uh, the PowerPoint of its age when it was invented. I keep um, thinking about Nathan Selland, who was a uh, ten year old. Let's see, nineteen eight eighty to nineteen ninety, had a brain tumor and died in our congregation. And he, he I believe, his grandfather had taught him all these Bible stories with these windows. Really? Yeah. So that was his catechism or whatever. That's how he learned the Bible stories. That so, is so cool. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. Actually, actually, we're kind of hoping we can use them that way again. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, his name is on the piano you play. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is a gift from his uh, grandpa, grandparent. No, no, no. From his friends of his grandparents. And wasn't his grandfather a music teacher? Yes. Yeah, James yeah. Yes. And the gift was from Nielsen's. Okay, sure. That makes sense. You might have to have an evening where you leave the lights on in the sanctuary and we can go up and look from the outside in if COVID doesn't let us back in. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. We could have little guides. Um, actually, Christy's talking about making little, little like booklet guides so that you could do that when it gets a little warmer. We could mm -hmm. have a six feet apart walk around. Yeah. Did you say at the beginning of the evening tonight that these sessions were going to be online as well? Yes. Um, the the session I'm recording here will be online, so okay. um, you can look at it that way. Um, and then eventually, um, of course, there's a lot of windows to work through. Christy will have it on the website so that if visitors pop in, 
um, and they go to the welcome section or wherever she decides is the best place to put it, it, it will direct them to a page where they can just explore them on their own. All right, well, let's close with prayer and then we'll pick up here next week. Let us pray. Gracious God, you speak words of love to us in every single moment of every single day. You've done that since the word was written as story to explain the world as we know it. And more importantly, to declare your love in the midst of a broken world. We ask, Lord, that you would carry that love in our hearts so that we might become inflamed with love for your creation and for our neighbor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everybody, thank you very much for being with us tonight. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks, not next week, but two weeks. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you. Nice. Good night, everybody.